That's a great question. Um, the part here is, you know, if you don't have a leadership uh, buy-in first, no analytics office will be successful. So uh, there are two parts, right? So someone may say, yes, we need an analytics um, office built in, but they truly don't understand what it means. Or they are not visionary, or they are actually saying, you know, you have to build this office to actually validate what I already think is right. So having those conversations up front, getting the buy-in so folks understand what the office delivers, right, what the department will do, you know, how will success be measured, how will you then, you know, put things in place so that you have guidelines and processes to actually validate if you're improving things. You know, if you want to be a data-driven organization, you need to start way at the top and get everyone's alignment, um, but have to be short-term focused for that alignment because people have a very short span of attention. So if you don't deliver something in, say, 90 days or six months, you'll lose that executive buy-in very quickly. So here is an analogy I've used, right? So we may think, I want to climb Mount Everest one day. So if you put that out as the, this is the goal, I think a lot of folks will, I'm never going to make it. If you say, you know, one day we'll climb Mount Everest, but today I'm going to go Mount Rainier, you know, or something else, right? So, or today I'm going to just climb a hill. So the goal here is at the strategy level, you want to make sure you have the eyes in a five-year or longer plan but break them into modules and say, to get there, these are the things that we're going to do currently. This is how we'll get here. Let's do baby steps first. So you get um, addicted to success. Right? The goal here is to make sure folks understand that in a short time, you can get something you can utilize immediately. And that's, that gets them convinced that in the long run, you'll deliver what you're looking for. So it, uh, from my perspective, and I've gone through that journey because I actually went from being a chief analytics into a data and analytics. And I think the reason being very often, even though the two teams have the same incentive structure, they reported to different parts of the organization and often resulted in finger pointing, which means at the end, something was incorrect. It was always, oh, the IT folks did not deliver the data correctly, and the you know, IT folks would usually say the analytics folks didn't ask for the data correctly, um, and nobody you know, won in that scenario, right? Um, at the end, when it's at the CEO level or a CEO level, you know, the operations officer, they're looking at the enterprise picture and saying, how do we make it such that we deliver value most efficiently? And in doing so, I think the alignment has started to become where the systems are still owned by the CTO, CIO, but often the process of acquisition of data and then converting it into usable format, especially in the analytics warehouse kind of space, is actually falling under the CDAO or the Chief Data and Analytics Officer. So that's another great question here. I think part of the analytics officer role, you already had the data governance kind of within their um, domain, if you wanted to say, because at the end, they are responsible for data quality. So even though the data and analytics roles hadn't, you know, sort of been combined, often the analytics officer owned the, you know, data governance, data quality, the master data management aspects. Now they have made it more formal where the councils or the data stewards sort of, you know, fall under the CDAO office so that they, you know, manage or set up the expectations on what uh, data should look like within systems. In terms of time, this is the investment, right? The early on you make investments in the right data. The latter half of it of doing the predictive models is that much easier. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, of our folks yesterday at the uh, panels had also said this, right? They spend more time cleaning up data. And so we've tried to set it up such that early on you can actually get data right in the right systems, and that way downstream the impact is uh, faster analytics. So I think time division from my end is not as much, um, you know, as if it was prior, right? What we've done is align the two. So um, part of that is twofold. Um, I think 
often focus is on skills, right? People look, you know, do you have Python skills? Do you have SAS skills? Or can you do SQL or ETL? We've tried to combine the skills with a couple other factors, which, you know, sometimes people overlook. Do you have the curiosity? Can you learn? Can you grow? Are you willing to work as a team and share information? Because sometimes folks with the brightest skills are unable to work with others, and then you're not getting the product that you're looking for. So often we go actually to um, graduate schools and start recruiting relatively early. We also bring in a lot of interns in. Most of the time, 60% of our interns will get hired for a role because we've sort of trained them, right? At a low cost, you've you know, tried to figure out is this person going to work in the long term? But the biggest thing we do for hiring is we don't hire for short term. We're always looking of saying, okay, you come into this role today, you know, can you grow into one of the future roles that are going to happen? And so number one recruiting aspect for us is actually growth and curiosity. Um, the rest is, you know, I try and tell folks, I can train you on anything if you're willing to be trained. Right? If, you, if you've already figured out that I know everything, then there's nothing I can do. So then the question becomes, you know, are you a good fit for the team or aren't you? So um, in the other part of, uh, you know, questions that usually get asked, um, which is how do you keep the talent, right? They are here, they are bright. How do you keep them engaged? And I think sometimes you have to look when you have the brightest of the bright and there is not much opportunity in the organization. Can you help them, you know, grow in their career and move on somewhere else? Because at the end, all you've done is created a bigger network. So then you get talent from, um, you know, their offices too, right? As they go into a director or a VP role and they have somebody who's talented, you sort of get a network of pool at the senior level. And that's a great question. You know, uh, and I, again, when I was growing up, you know, women were not supposed to know math. I, I guess, you know, somewhere along the way, somebody forgot to tell me that. Um, so we've, we've sort of looked at it of saying, you know, regardless of where you come from, right, or gender or race or, you know, even in other instances, people come from different walks of life, right? They didn't pursue a STEM education, you know, the science, technology, engineering and math. We've looked at it as in moment in time, where are you today? You know, if you are in a place where you're curious and you're willing to learn, we'll invest the time to bring in. So at the same time, we put in a lot of effort to go in, you know, whether we do volunteering work or I, I chair a couple boards, you know, part of our uh, agenda is to make sure we promote diversity and, and get the talent in early on and actually train them in thinking because sometimes they're very good, you know, and, and they stay at a lower level then. They don't know the softer skills of moving upwards in your career. And a lot of things that you know, have to be learned are the communication, getting buy-in, building the trust, networking. Often analytics folks you know, don't value those things because they think my work will show and then people will just like what I'm doing and guess what, they'll promote me. And you know, often that's not how things work. And, and often, you know, we call them uh, going down the rabbit holes, right? We are all used to it. I've done it in my, uh, you know, days too. When you get into a problem, you're like, I have to go figure this one out. Um, we usually try and partner folks so that there's always one person who's keeping his or her eye, you know, on the big picture or on being able to deliver because everything is um, within a certain time frame. So all of our projects or our work is time bound. So it has to be done within this time, right? So there is someone who's always, um, you know, setting expectations of saying, that's great, we'll follow that some other time, but today we need to do this. And so having people who are partners so that one is invested in actually doing the research or the work or the building of the model, you know, the other one is more focused on trying to get the value in, it has worked for us as building out that long-term partnership. So for our function, you know, and, and we have, uh, you know, predominantly in the acute care spectrum, which is for us the hospitalist, you know, the emergency physicians. And our number one goal is to make sure that we have in real time information for our physicians to actually impact patient care. And that puts everything in perspective, right? So if you were to tell somebody, 
you know, as a patient is going, say, into a septic shock, that, oh, I think your patient is going to go into septic shock. They're like, it's too late. I'm so sorry, nothing can be done. So for us, everything that we try and do is how much quicker, faster, better can we give information for our physicians such that they can prevent, you know, say, sepsis, or they can prevent somebody from having to come back into the hospital within a certain time frame. Or, you know, in many instances, things are relatively simple. I try and tell folks, right? When we go in and we are in pain, we don't think, ah, oh, you know, should I or shouldn't I get a CT scan because long-term impact I may potentially, you know, have harmful effects, right? At that time, you just want the pain gone. So we want the physician at least to be empowered to say, the chances of something being, you know, caught by a CT are very low. So let's not go ahead and get a CT scan. It's not going to be the high impact. Um, or a staffing model, right? How many times have we gone into the emergency room and waited for more than an hour? Um, so some of the things that we try and do are relatively simple. So our goal for the next 12 months, and it's been our ongoing goal, is to look at those opportunities which will actually help the patient when they are in that acute care. And at that time, all they need is medical help. And how do we make it faster, better, smoother, but right, um, and all in real time. So technology-wise, we're actually looking at things which will help us gather data in real time and be able to send back secure messages all in real time. And I say real time, by then it's become near real time, right? Because even 10 seconds is long enough. So we're really trying to look at what does it look like for us so that we can reduce that uh, exposure and give out the best information. Um, so from our perspective, we've looked at many, we're, we're technology agnostic. We will, in a sandbox, evaluate anything, and we're not chasing the shiny objects. I want to be clear, you know, there are two parts to this, right? We stay very focused on business goals and saying, these are our problems that we're trying to work, and which technology will let us do that the best. So it's not best in breed and technology, but best to address those business problems. And I have, over time, you know, looked at all of the qualities, both in the mentors that I had and people who've been successful. I think number one is be passionate about what you do. If you don't love it, it is obvious, right? If you do it for the money or if you do it for the title, it is a short-term gain. You've got to really love what you're doing because others who interact with you will pick up on that. And then they react to that because your passion and your drive will bring them along. The second, it's a people skill. And, and I know sometimes, you know, talk, the enterprises will talk, data is our number one asset or something. I always say, no, people are your number one assets. Because they truly understand, you know, the business need, the culture, the reaction, how to do it. And they also have something, which is their motivation to do the right thing for the patient, right? We've all been patients at some time or the other. And so if, if you have those people skills of building the trust and building a team and, you know, aligning so that everybody, um, you know, follows, right? The greatest part of being, you know, a leader is to go in places that others haven't gone, but make sure that folks understand it can be done. So they'll follow, right? Um, and then the third one is, is to always be able to balance. So um, sometimes, you know, we, we get lost in the, this would be really cool research project, or this will be really cool. At the end, if you can't take actions from it, or it doesn't re result in something, what good is it? Right? So, you know, what can you do in such a way that you can bring, you know, actions, results, and get everybody addicted to success? <laughs>